Today, the first panel of the day uh, will be about um, participation in the city. Uh, yesterday, we had a panel with new institutions. Please, please, please come on stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, we'll have a panel with, uh, with three uh, international professionals, but they are not, uh, except for one, um, museum directors. And uh, they will not talk about the institutions, but we will talk about events more than uh, the museum itself as a venue or uh, as an institution. Um, I will just introduce my three uh, panelists. Uh, so we have uh, Munira Mirza, Mirza uh, who comes from London. Uh, she's the head of Henny Talks uh, today, which uh, is a um, non-for-profit um, project uh, aiming at uh, creating uh, videos uh, about artists, which you can see a trailer uh, behind this uh, curtain here. Uh, but before this, Munira was uh, the deputy mayor uh, for the city of London and uh, in charge of uh, culture and education. And uh, she was uh, in office uh, during the uh, 2012 uh, Olympic Games when they were in London. And uh, Munira worked a lot uh, uh, with the cultural institutions of the city, uh, working on projects um, to get the Londoners and the audiences, local audiences, to, to get engaged uh, with uh, the Olympic Games. Uh, Gloria Gerais. Uh, comes from Los Angeles and um, she runs a cultural consultancy which is called Culture Projects, which uh, the words mean what, uh, what she does, uh, Cultural Projects. And uh, Gloria has been um, uh, setting uh, this fantastic uh, program which is called Pacific Standard Time. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard about this. It's led uh, primarily by the, um, backed by the Getty Center plus 70 um, South Californian uh, institutions that have gathered uh, to create an event uh, that lasts for six months, four months, four months uh, and that took place uh, twice already. Uh, but it is not an event, uh, it's not a BNL, it's the, it happens when it happens. It's like every six years, they, 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 they know they will do a third edition, but they don't know when uh, yet. Uh, and uh, Xavier, Roland, who's uh, the, our local uh, rep representative, because when you do panels, we always try to mix people that come from many places, and we are always very happy to have someone from here. So Xavier is not really from Brussels, but he's from Mons, which is 45 minutes from here? Yeah, 45 minutes by 45 car. 45 yeah. minutes by car. And Xavier uh, is the head of the Paul Muséal and the director of the Fine Arts Museum of Mons. And he was the director of uh, the program in 2015, uh, Mons Capital Européenne de la Culture. I'm sure you, you all know this, um, this European uh, cultural capital that is led by the European Union and that uh, every year um, just selects two towns, two cities, uh, and to, to, to raise awareness about them and, and to create uh, cultural projects uh, to engage uh, the European communities. I was not the director. The curator was Yves Vasseur. I was okay. in charge of exhibition and museum. Okay, Just in charge of the exhibitions. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so today, um, my first question to you guys um, will be uh, about uh, how to engage local communities when you have projects that are meant primarily when you think about them. Uh, you think that these three kinds of projects uh, are projects that are primarily meant to, to raise a global awareness and, to, and, to, and to, to get attractivity for your cities, for your territories, uh, for your institutions. And uh, we, we all understand that uh, welcoming the Olympic Games or uh, being a European capture for culture or federating 70 uh, SoCal uh, institutions is very good for uh, attracting tourists or, or people from, from outside of the territories. And uh, like in, in, there's, there's also a touristic uh, strategy. And my question is, in this kind of projects, what, how, what is, the, is, is engaging local communities a priority? 
politically or socially? And, uh, and is it, is, is, is it a, a real strategy? So I will, I will first ask uh, Gloria, because uh, Pacific Standard Time just ended in January this year. And, uh, and please, uh, you thank have you, the... Thank you, thank you, and thank you for joining me. Um, so I'm going to talk primarily about the marketing and communications um, campaign that supports the initiative called Pacific Standard Time. And I know that some of you might have heard about the initiative from my colleagues, John Giardini and Miranda Ca Carroll, who've given workshops about our initiative. But as a kind of just background, so Pacific Standard Time is a collaboration of 70, 80 museums um, putting on exhibitions along a theme um, simultaneously. And the first Pacific Standard Time was art in LA, 1945 to 1980, that looked at art post-World War II, focusing on Southern California. And Pacific Standard Time LALA, LA, which we just completed in January, looked at Latin American and Latino art. And when I say that it's dozens of institutions, it's 80 cultural institutions, both museums and performing arts centers, from Santa Barbara to San Diego. And to give you, for those of you who have not visited California, so LA is in the middle, Santa Barbara is about 90 miles to the north, San Diego is about 110, 20 miles to the south, and then Palm Springs is another 100 miles to the east. So it's a very large geographic area. These initiatives are supported heavily by the Getty, but they're actually all a very tight collaboration. So the institutions work together in terms of curating the exhibitions, and they leave a very deep legacy in terms of scholarship. They also work together in terms of audience development, and that is one of our tent poles of the communications campaign, that we require institutions to cross promote each other. And one of the ways we do this is, as I was describing that it's a very large geographic area, is we break our institutions down into smaller neighborhoods, which then would be maybe 10 or 15 museums, and we ask them to create programs together. And some of them create ads, some of them put on festivals, some of them give free days, and we work together for about a year, planning those different um, collaborations. In terms of audience development, you had asked also, we were talking about target audiences, and I just wanted to point out that the purpose of the campaign is to support our partners and to make sure visitors see the exhibitions. We want as many people to come as possible, but we need to target our audience. And the target audience that we created, we called the culturally curious. And these are the millennials, 20 to 35 year olds, they're college educated. They often go to cultural events. They go to concerts, they go to pop-ups, they know about art fairs, but they don't necessarily go inside of a museum. And that was our goal, very specifically that audience, which meant that our campaign, which I'll show you, our buy, our media buy, um, and our marketing activities were devoted to that group. We didn't ignore the art aware, but we had a different message for them. But we very specifically targeted what we called the culturally curious. Okay, thank you, Gloria. Uh, Munira, could you, could you tell us uh, what you did uh, as a deputy mayor and with the institutions when the Olympic Games were uh, coming to your city? Well, you asked the question first, why would we do it during the Olympics and Paralympics year? And I think the short answer is that there was a huge amount of skepticism about the Olympic Games. Uh, we look back now and think of 2012 uh, as being a huge success. It was very successful in terms of international profile and the way that ordinary Londoners feel about their city. But in 2005, when we won the bid, there were lots of people who were saying this is going to be a disaster, it's very expensive, it's all designed for the rest of the world, not for us, not for Londoners. So we there was we a have the same in Paris right now. I'm, you know. I'm sure. And this happens actually with any major sporting of event. The, the local people feel that it's a very disruptive event and it takes over their city for only two or three weeks, but it, it costs them a huge amount. 
So politically, as a city, the government was very concerned that we did events, that we uh, organized uh, a program of activity during that summer that would be for Londoners and that would inspire them uh, with culture and excite them about what was happening. Uh, it wasn't just a one-year phenomenon, though. And I think you know, it's interesting that um, Gloria's project, for instance, is really a four or five year project. And that's the way to think about hosting these major events, that the run up to the event is just as important. Mm -hmm. And uh, the focus that, that we had in the city, there was a, a separate national program that was run by the Olympic Organizing Committee in London, LOCOG, uh, which uh, was funded by central government. But we made a real effort in the city to focus on all Londoners, outer London, so not just the central London boroughs, but 33 boroughs, uh, uh, many of whom don't have large museums or galleries in their borough. So they are very reliant on some kind of central organizing framework. Uh, we focused on the outdoors. So we, we ran a program called Showtime, which was uh, a, a series of events over the summer of 2012 uh, which would be free outdoor events, very family friendly, working with local arts organizations and artists, funded largely by our office, but with partnerships uh, uh, with different funding agencies. So we worked very collaboratively. And that didn't just happen in that year. It, it was in the run-up to it. We organized a series of similar uh, citywide uh, activities in the run-up to the Games. And then after 2012, we continued that legacy. So we ran further programs uh, targeting these uh, different arts organizations in outer London uh, and, and, and trying to forge partnerships that would last uh, a much longer time uh, than, than just the Olympic and Paralympic Games. Okay, thank you. We will talk about legacy um, and in the, in the, the last question. Uh, Xavier, uh, how did you get to engage the Mons community and maybe the region community <coughs> with the capital of Anna Culture? Um, I bring some uh, yeah. picture. I don't know if you can show because just to, to show where is Mons because I'm sure not everybody no. know where is uh, this city, very close from, ah, okay, uh, very close from, um, from Brussels, 45 minutes uh, by car. But also it's a city in the heart of Europe, uh, close to Paris, London, uh, Cologne, Amsterdam. Uh, from the beginning, yeah, the first, uh, I have this uh, opportunity to work on the European Capital of Culture from the very beginning, on 2002. It means that we start to work on that project uh, something like 13 years before. You will understand why uh, it was so important for us. At the end, I was in charge of uh, exhibition and museums. Uh, during the European Capital of Culture, we opened five new museums. I will explain you later the importance of these uh, museums. And this museum integrates a network of uh, 11 museums, and we're trying to, to, to manage and to run this museum in a different way. We're trying to sharing work of art, team, and budget. Maybe the, the next um, photos will show you where is... Well, yeah, okay. This is where is uh, most. I need to make you understand why it, this um, project was very important for us and also was not only a cultural project. We have to go back and to give you a background. Um, most um, in the 1960, 1950, one was one of the more, most powerful economic in the world because uh, the coal mine, because the steel industry. And this uh, industry collapsed in the beginning of 70. And you can imagine the big economic crisis we get. And from that point to, to uh, something like 90. 1992 and the beginning of um, uh, 2000, uh, we had a very big rate of unemployment, 20, 25 percent from some part of region, which is very high. And uh, when we decided to be candidate to be European Capital of Culture, it was not only a project for uh, a cultural project, but it was a project for regions uh, from economic way from um, 
a social way. And we wanted to involve all the population, all the citizens in the concept, because it was not only one year capital of culture, but we wanted to, to give a new project to a region. That's why that's the question you ask is so important for us. And just to finish, um, um, we had a good timing, because uh, at that time we could get funds from Europeans, and we use uh, that fund to restore all the city and to build new architecture. We have a new concrete center for Libeskin, new railway station from Calatrava, and we open, as I said, five new museums. We invest half a billion in 20 years. You can imagine. It's a very small city. It's 100,000 people, no more. Very small region. And, um, of course, we have also this just to show that we don't, didn't want to have just a cultural project. Uh, we have this clever idea, very beginning 2002, to, uh, to connect the concept of the, um, the project to the new technology. And we have this slogan, when culture meets technology. And after that, Google decided to come in Mons. The first data center in Europe came to most after IBM, after Microsoft. And we have now many startups working close to uh, this project. I think it's thanks to this politics open and uh, connected with Europe. And of course, we develop a large program to involve people and citizens in the concept yes. of capital of culture. Thank you very much. Uh, just, can you just give us very briefly, uh, the three of us, uh, a specific example of how, you, how you, you, you got to imply these people in your project and how it worked? And, and, and then after, we'll see the, the legacy. But for example, uh, when, you, you, when you talk about the social side of uh, Capital Europe and la Culture, uh, what did you do with the citizens? Did you, did, have you, were they transformed into ambassadors of their city? How, how they. Well, did you did you tell them to, or did you form them to, to welcome the visitors? Or what, what did you do specifically to, to, to engage the community in the in the project? To me, yeah, yeah, to yeah. And, then, and then to uh, okay, we can have another uh, picture from just to show you a membership um, uh, campaign that we we start. You know, uh, it, it's not necessary to explain you that. Uh, people at the beginning didn't believe that uh, such kind of project could give a rebirth of a region in a, in a new economic uh, uh, development. And as you can see there, you, you, we have this slogan, in 2015, I'm Motua and you. And we, we didn't take people from Mons, but we took people from above, from the United States, from Austria, from Italy, and uh, just to show people that it's possible to be proud about our city, our culture, our legacy. And you have to understand when we have a so big crisis, people don't trust anymore to themselves. And the first thing that was very important for us is to, to restore the self confidence to, to themselves. And what we did, the first, if we go to the next slide, um, what we did, uh, we, we did uh, a program and we organized different exhibitions. But we didn't want to make blockbuster exhibition that we could make any place, any way, any time. Uh, and uh, because we wanted always to do something strongly connected with the roofs of or culture of territory. And there is something very completely incredible. Uh, did you know that one of the most important artists in the European culture, Vincent van Gogh, came to Mons, spent two years of his life in Mons, and decided to be an artist in Mons. And after the show, we understand because at the beginning, we, we start, oh no, he, he just spent a few times, but after he go away, no. He spent two years, he decided to be an artist in Mons, and we see that all the subject, all the, the concept and the idea of the art of Van Gogh were come, come 
to the Mons and the Borinage. You can imagine for the people how surprised they were that one of the most important artists became an artist here in Mons and they receive influence from uh, this uh, region. And the last slide, the, all the museum that we, we opened, five new museums, we trying always to make connection between, between the local, the local and the universal. We opened uh, uh, the, the Flint uh, mine, it's a UNESCO um, heritage, uh, the Belfour, Heritage, um, um, UNESCO Heritage too, and Musée du Doudou, the Museum of Doudou, um, connected with the St. George and the, the Dragon, uh, the fight of the myth of St. George and the Dragon, also connected with uh, UNESCO uh, Heritage. And uh, the last one is the Most Memorial Museum. All these museums connected with our story, with uh, your heritage, and trying to show this heritage connected with the universal. That was the first thing very important. And the last things I want to tell, if we go to the next, the last one, we discovered something. We discovered something. We didn't expect that. Um, we, we suddenly, when we start to organize many events outside the city, inside the city, but outside the museum. And we discovered people that were want it and they want to be involved in the project. If we go to the, the two um, next slides, uh, I want to tell just very briefly two projects. The first one, because they we inspired us before, for the, 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 the next year, um, what we call the Jardin Suspendu. We asked to the collective artists coming uh, in a place, an empty place in the middle of the city, and we asked them to, to, to to develop something with the citizen. And uh, they, they start to make a kitchen, table, haven for, for, to make bread. And all the neighbors start to, to believe in the project. And this project is still running now. We didn't, they didn't receive any support from the, the, the city, but they're still going on. And the, last, the, the other project we call Café Europa, uh, we, we're trying, it is, as you can see, it's very special structure inside the city, temporary structure. And th this is a place when we, people could come and to make creative workshop. They could come to meet people, to have a beer, to, to talk. It's a, a, it was a place when you, you put it for the citizen. And there was a, a special uh, thing that I want to talk, it's the okay. Europa Wall. I mean, it was a place when people can sit, have a beer, uh, and talking with someone located uh, in Australia, in the United States, and talking with them just as they were in the same room. And we're talking about social exactly. issue, about a different kind of subject. Thank this you. is the kind of project we <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sorry. I just give the, uh, very briefly, uh, Gloria and Munira. Gloria, uh, can, can you just tell us uh, how you imply the uh, local community with one specific example, ju just one? And, uh, show the video. Yeah, you, you can show the so video. Yeah. I just want to show you a video that's the campaign, because one of our challenges was we wanted to invite this audience, but how do you tell them about 80 exhibitions, all different, ancient art, contemporary art, Latin American art, which is not um, all the same, Latino art, which is very different. So how do you explain all of this to the millennial? And if you queue up the video, this is our solution. Led by the Getty, Pacific Standard up, up. Time LA LA is a collaborative effort from art institutions across Southern California.
So we decided that the way to explain Pacific Standard Time was to not show works of art, but to describe them and let, with very provocative phrases, and then let people respond um, to those phrases. And we, if you go to our website now, you will see a reveal video that shows all uh, 60 some lines, which we made buttons and billboards and wild postings and used as um, digital ads, um, which we thought would uh, entice so, uh, a discussion. So did the millennial community of so Southern California got very implied in the project and, and but the, because you said uh, no, no social media. It's, no, we use so. It, it no, is we, it's, it is provocative, but but in the end, it worked very well. Yes, it, and no. we we actually did use social media. Yeah, I, so I know. the majority <laughs> of our buy was social, um, but we used it in a that way that art, was going yeah. to so the museum. So written, there's no image. Okay. Exactly. That's great. Exactly. Munira, can, could you tell us about the specific uh, action you took for engaging local communities? Yeah, we in the city we created a. a uh, an initiative called Team London, which was designed to get local Londoners to volunteer during the Olympics and Paralympic Games. They had a year of training, uh, they were selected, and they had to give their time during that three-week period of the Olympic Games and then the, the, the two-and-a-half-week period of the Paralympics to welcome visitors to London. And the idea was to, to make a, a welcoming city, to make it accessible, to give information to tourists who are coming, because obviously many, many people visit during the um, Olympic Games. But it was also to create a body of people who were committed to the city and who identified. And really, if you ask Londoners now, their abiding memories of that time, it was the volunteering, it was the fact that they were there to smile, uh, to welcome people, they were very enthusiastic. And they completely transformed people's perceptions of London and also of cultural institutions. Many of them were in positions outside museums and galleries like the South Kensington Museums Quarter, which is quite an intimidating place if yeah. you don't go into museums, but there were visitors there welcoming them, wearing bright t-shirts. And so it was, a, it was a really good way of exciting local people about their city and about what we have to offer. The, the one thing we didn't do very much of, interestingly, and it was 2012, so it was six years ago, was engage enough on social media. And I think that that's where, um, if we were to do it again, it won't happen anytime soon. But I would say that um, using video, like the, the one that Gloria's just shown, using digital uh, to promote more actively, that's something where I think, you know, particularly museums now can do more. In my, in my current role directing Henny Talks, which is a digital platform, it's all about using short film to tell the stories inside museums and galleries and to get people engaged in a different medium. I think that's where so much of the future lies. And we were doing things in a very analog way. We were welcoming people face to face and that interaction is really important. But we have this incredible new tool now, which is to communicate via social media, for people to share and spread the word to their friends, their family. They, they are trusted sources. If you get a recommendation to go to a museum or a gallery through a friend or uh, a member of your family, that's much more powerful than an advert on the tube or uh, uh, the traditional kind of leaflets that, that we're used to producing. So I think as a city or a city government, that's where I would put a lot more effort. And I'm, I know that museums, obviously we work with museums through my initiative and we, we make films with museums and we promote them online for free. That is the, 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 the kind of the, the trick, how to do that in a way that really engages people. Thank you very much. Um, and I got a little plug-in for my initiative. I hope you noticed. <laughs> Slip that in. <laughs> Great. So uh, w we're, we're running out of, out of time. I, I would just ask you um, if you have any questions. I'm sure you guys have questions to ask uh, to our panelists. Uh, please uh, please uh, raise your hand. And please, before asking your question, uh, tell us who you are and uh, which institution you work for. Thank you. Yes. Is it working? Is it working? Work yes, thank you. I will take advantage of the microphone that I already have. My name is Maria Vailatak. I'm uh, from the EUI, uh, European University Institute in Italy, and uh, National Library in Estonia. And my question is um, what are your thoughts on 
how, how does the national level um, fit into this? Or how does national um, pride, for example, factor in when we are talking about um, involving or engaging communities um, in the case of such massive projects like European uh, Capital of Culture or, or Olympic Games? We're talking about the regional level and the universal level, but with with nationalism on the rise, um, and, and it can be a very prideful thing, but it can also be a divisive thing. So is this something you, you think about, um, how to address that uh, when, when engaging the communities, uh, or do you rather um, remain committed to the ideal that, that cities are um, a melting pot for, for diversity and, and you kind of don't, don't touch upon that level, or, or what are your thoughts on that? I think you have to try and do both. Um, London is a multicultural city, it's a global city, but it's also a capital city. And many of our tourists came from the rest of the UK. Uh, and there was no contradiction in the minds of people who live in London and who visited that it, it is both. Uh, and uh, we certainly put on programs that would appeal uh, to people of different nationalities and different ethnic backgrounds. But underpinning that was a strong sense that this was a national event and that there was pride in that. Uh, and and I, don't think, um, I don't think people felt that um, it was right that, that London as a city should benefit from the Olympic and Paralympic Games and it, it should be separate uh, to, to what else was going on. And there were many events around the country that were linked by satellite. We watched, screen, uh, we watched the London uh, events and cultural events and sporting events on large screens in cities like Manchester and Glasgow. So there was, um, I think, a, a, a connection between the national and the city and the international. Uh, and not every uh, uh, city uh, has the same kind of global connectivity, but I think most museums and galleries can claim to be international in some way, can have some international residents. I'm going to agree with you, and I'm going to go back to something you said about it was the preparations the year mm -hmm. up. Because oftentimes what's happening in your city, it's actually more important to go outside and have people start talking about it outside and then bring it in. And that idea of reaching different audiences on the way up to the event is so important um, to reach both the tourists or the national level audience and then bring it to the local level because then the local level gets more pride that this is actually happening here in our museum in our city. Yeah. And the, the story for Mons was much more complicated because um, the European capital of culture um, was the opportunity for Mons to be recognized mm -hmm. as a city, European city. And that was not that easy at the beginning, to, to make people believe in the project from local people to national people. It was a big fight at the beginning to decide, oh, one Walloon and one Flemish, you know, the, the, the Belgium is quite difficult. And um, that's, for us, the first fight is to, to, to prove that Mons could be European capital of culture and to, to teach something. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Hi, I'm Juliette Fritsch. I'm here from the <clears throat> Natural History Museum of Denmark, but uh, I was living and working in the States until quite recently, and I went to the first PST, which was amazing, and I highly recommend when the next one comes. But I am interested in a couple of things to do with how you know about who your audience is, because first of all, coordinating across 80 different institutions, how do you, do you collect meaningful data? And secondly, when PSD is happening at such irregular intervals and, you know, quite large intervals, how do you project into the future for your new audiences? Because, you know, five, six years from now, Generation Z is coming up. They're very different to the millennials. Millennials are aging out. <laughs> and I feel like we've only just got to know them. So I was just interested in that's your a very audience good, approach. That's a very good question. And when you were talking about social media, I mean, one of the things that we learned is from the first Pacific Standard Time, 2011, we barely used social media. Mm. But in 2017, we heavily used social media. So the difference in five years or so is, is, 
is grand. Um, we, do, we did do a study. We did learn that we had 2.8 million people visit a Pacific Standard Time LALA exhibition or program. We did know that 40% of them were in the millennial category. As you said, how do you organize all of this with 80 museums? Um, it is very difficult. And we're not only organizing very large museums, but then some museums that are 1,000 square feet and are very, 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 very tiny. Um, but that's part of what the campaign does. Your question about brand awareness is one that the, the, the campaign thinks about is, how did we build on Pacific Standard Time art in LA? And a lot of people remembered it. Um, the next initiative we know will be maybe in five or six years. And the question is then, how will the brand um, survive? And that's for us to discover. Well, thank you very much. Maybe one last question, or we can move on to the case studies. Yeah. Uh, there's one question there. Hi, I'm Yael Eitan from the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. And I also had a question from, for Gloria. The film that you showed us, was that an actual TV spot that was targeted to millennials? No. Or was, okay, I didn't Sorry, think so. For the, that is actually just a summary. The, okay, got The it. TV spots would be those lines. There would be a fighter jet with Jesus, and it would run fast, fast, fast. You can see a lot of that on our website now. But the TV spots, the radio spots, the social spots, the all of the campaign use those lines. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.